Okay, I think we can get, uh, get started. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Hans Sterk. I'm from the University of Waterloo in Canada. And I wanted to welcome you all to this uh, plenary session of our second Cyan Games annual meeting. Originally, it was to be held in Toronto, but now it is held everywhere around the world, which is kind of extraordinary, I think, and exciting. Um, I hope you're all safe and well, wherever you are. And it is my great pleasure to introduce today uh, to this plenary speaker, Professor Lars Rutoto from uh, Emory University. Um, so Lars is an assistant professor of mathematics and computer science at Emory. He received his diploma and his PhD in mathematics from the University of Münster in Germany in 2010 and 2012. Um, his research interests include numerical analysis, in particular uh, PDEs, um, numerical methods uh, for optimization, and numerical linear algebra. And he also works on scientific computing with applications in machine learning and medical and geophysical imaging. He has authored and co-authored more than 35 peer-reviewed applications and he's a recipient of several national grants in the US, including an NSF Early Career Award. Um, so uh, today Lars will talk to us about uh, partial differential equations meet deep learning, old solutions for new problems and vis uh, vice versa. Uh, we look forward to a great talk. Um, Lars, the stage is yours. All right, uh, thank you, Hans, for this kind introduction. I'd also like to thank Siam and the Kames for holding the meeting virtually and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm delighted to be here and uh, have such a big audience for this talk. And the goal of my talk is to highlight new connections that have been made recently between deep learning and partial differential equations. Let me start with um, the, the, really what it's all about, that is understanding the world through models and data these days. I want to give two examples to compare how models and data improve our understanding, both in the deep learning and in the PDE paradigm. So let's start with image recognition, one of deep learning's hallmark applications. The goal here is to teach the computer to recognize that this image shows a dog or more precisely a Commodore. Um, and if you think about how to do this, it's very difficult to write a computer program that explicitly uh, accomplishes this task. But in recent years, neural networks trained with millions of data have actually surpassed our ability to, to classify such images. Yet, we sometimes fail to understand why and when deep learning works and how it even makes a decision. The second application is um, is uh, precision medicine. Here, PDEs have been very successful. So the example you see on the right is from my colleague and collaborator, Alessandro Veneziani at Emory. Uh, his team uses spe patient-specific models and uh, helps surgeons to decide if a given stent is a good fit for a patient prior to an operation. So this pipeline here is completely different from the deep learning paradigm. It consists of physical models for accomplishing registration to fit the stent to the patient uh, geometry and fluid dynamic simulations to carry out uh, these simulations and ultimately decide on a success rate for the given patient. So when you first look at these two examples, you may think about them to be very different. But the message I want to convey is that they really span a continuous spectrum where on the left-hand side, you rely mostly on data, and on the right-hand side, you, you rely mostly on models. With this perspective, you realize that there are many applications um, in, to, in, in today's world where a combination of, the, of these two tools is a key to success. And that's really the message I want to bring with the talk, to build bridges between these, uh, these communities and make us more comfortable um, to, to use tools from both areas. Before we go there, I want to uh, take a minute and introduce some useful terminology from deep learning. Deep learning is a, is, is a term for machine learning with deep neural networks, which are neural networks with many hidden layers. Here in this example, you have uh, two hidden layers in a four layer network with an input and an output layer, 
Later on, we will take the continuous limit and go to infinitely deep neural networks. It's important to note that unlike applied mathematics, where progress has been more or less continuous, artificial intelligence as a field has, has been operating in waves. Since the 1950s, there have been many phases of boom and bust, also ca called AI summers and winters, respectively. So for about a decade, there has been a really hot summer, which has been fueled by news breaking achievements and mostly the enabled by massive data and uh, computing power. So when you, read, when you read about all these amazing achievements of deep learning, you may hear stories like this. Okay, so you take lots of data, you use something called backpropagation, hook up your GPU or graphic processing unit, pick one of these uh, software languages and you achieve amazing things. If you read articles like that, you may wonder what role can computation and applied mathematics actually play here in deep learning. In my experience, the story is often much more complicated and there are many choices in modern deep learning that can make or break an example. Um, many of these choices are not well understood and even if deep learning does work, we don't know how and why. So therefore, I hope to uh, give you a few examples now uh, how mathematics can play this key role and has been playing this key role uh, in, in, uh, in, in modern deep learning. So questions are very widespread. And here I want to give you just a few pointers and, and a few ma major uh, directions. Expressibility is one. So why does your network um, represent the function you're interested in or why does it fail to do so? Next is learning or opt through optimization. Why do some algorithms we typically apply in computational science and engineering uh, don't really work well for deep neural networks and how can we make sure that the optimal model actually generalizes beyond the data I was trained on. At this point I should highlight uh, the mini tutorial that Adam Overman is going to give tomorrow. Uh, explainability, we don't know how a neural network makes a decision. Robustness, um, deep neural networks can be fooled and are oftentimes unstable uh, to small perturbations of input. Um, Lots of advances have been made and many more are hopefully to come. Fairness, you may have heard that in the news recently that deep neural networks oftentimes use features they are not supposed to use, like the color of your skin. Um, and then there is scientific use cases for machine learning where we need to overcome many of these barriers, including also fast computation to uh, process more data at lower cost and in a more reliable and transparent way. Uh, there is a, a workshop uh, right after the SIAM and Keynes annual meeting, uh, also held virtually for free, so you can register for that one too. Uh, so in all these cases, applied mathematics, uh, I think, is a great tool for, for driving that field and making it also accessible to new, to new ventures. So the roadmap for my, to my, for my talk is as follows. My main goal is to highlight connections between PDEs, ODEs, and deep learning. Um, this is roughly the roadmap we are going to follow. So we will first talk, make the connections from PDEs, bringing tools along into deep learning. Um, we will do this in two parts, first going from ODEs to deep learning and then adding a spatial dimension for, to end up with PDEs. Then in the last bit of the talk, we will go the opposite way and show how deep learning can uh, tackle the curse of dimensionality and high dimensional problems. This work that I'm gonna show you would not have happened and would not have been nearly as much fun without this uh, amazing team at Emory that I have and also this network of collaborators. Um, I wanna highlight Eldad Haber who pulled me into this area and with uh, Eldad's group, uh, we have work, been working consistently and continuously very closely on continuous models for deep learning. Then uh, Stephanie Günther, uh, she has also organized a, a scattered team but uh, very effective uh, to bring the latest advances from optimal control and high performance computing to deep, deep learning. Um, Iran Trister at Ben Gurion in Israel and I have been working on using structured linear algebra operators and ideas for multigrid to make learning for large scale data more efficient. And finally, since my uh, stay at IPAM in the last fall, I've been working with Stan Osha and his, his amazing team at UCLA 
um, on applications of deep neural networks to high dimensional mean field games and controls. So all these works I will, I will elaborate on as I, as I go along and many others as well. Um, okay, so let's, let's start with making the connection between ODEs and deep learning. And I want to do this by walking you through a, a simple uh, yet quite actually already interesting example how to solve a deep learning problem. What you see on the left are some training points in 2D that are labeled in two classes, red and blue. Um, and you do see a pattern in there. The goal is to train a DNN that I sketched here in the middle to classify the data. So the DNN acts as a function which takes two inputs and gives one output. Here the probability of a point being blue and you can use this mapping to then label all the points in the 2D plane. And as you can see in this result, um, the, uh, the function is successful in the sense it's consistent with the data, but also it sort of generalizes beyond the data. At least that would have been probably the function I would have come up with. Okay, so I'm now gonna walk you through step-by-step step how, how this happens in practice. Um, let's build what is called a residual neural network. That's a relatively recent neural network architectures, uh, architecture, but the, it's uh, one of the most famous ones and, and, and it's our key into this whole area. So let's denote the training data as points Y and C. So it's pairs of points. Y is a vector in R2 and C is just zero or one. Um, and let's say we have infinitely many of them or we can generate more and you can still see them here on the right then the goal is to build this deep neural network. And I'm gonna start with the first layer. Um, and that in my case, I, I just use a fixed matrix Kn um, that does the following. It just takes a Y and adds a zero in, in, in the third component. I'm doing, so because, doing this because then I can easily plot to you in the end what's going on. So, okay, so now we are here. This Kn will be fixed for me. I'm not gonna train it. And now we need to talk about how to get from these three numbers here to, to those three numbers here. And I'm uh, characterizing this here with the dots because this is where the ResNet, our residual network comes in. And I'm going to take many, many steps, big N of them, like a hundred, think about that. Um, and they are built up in the following way. So the first step takes you not, applies an affine transformation and then this activation function sigma, in our case, you can see this red line here, it, it um, squashes everything between, to, in between minus one and one and um, multiplies with a small scalar h. Um, so you add this, uh, it's called a residual network because um, this part that we are going to train in the end uh, accounts for the residual between y, uh, u1 and u0. And you keep doing this n times until you uh, hit uh, un in the end um, which is these three, which are these three dots. And then you do one more step, namely you apply yet again an affine transformation, this time with a matrix that only has one row. And this function S, which is a sigmoid function, you can see here, um, sorry, the blue, um, that squashes everything between zero and one. And so the output Z here, you can interpret as a, pro as a predicted probability. Um, the weights of the ResNet, um, I'm going to denote as uh, with a lower script I here and theta is going to be my notation for weights of neural networks. So um, I take the KI and the BI that you can see here and uh, put them in there. And then the overall model reads as a big F that takes Y is parameterized by theta and produces a Z. And the weights of the whole model are all the ResNet weights as well as the weights here on the last layer. Okay, great. So now the, the key question is how do you pick the weights? You start randomly and then you solve an optimization problem. Um, in my case, it's a regularized loss um, where I'm just adding a, a simple Tikhonov or machine learning called weight decay regularization. And it, I phrase it as an expected uh, value problem here because then um, you can think about infinite amount of data. And uh, this excellent um, review paper has uh, is a whole monograph on how to solve this optimization problem. I will not talk about it much here but I will just uh, say that it is a very difficult problem uh, in general, but we will want to make it simple, okay? So I managed to solve this and now I can show you what happens in the training data as you go from these two dots to those two dots. So here's the dynamics that our network learns. So I think about this really as a, so you see 2D projections um, and you see all these features 
being pushed around by the action of the network. And each frame here is, is, is one layer. And I want to stop this video relatively close to the end. We can go a little bit closer. See like this. So that is almost the last layer of the network. And at this point, you see that all the blue points are on one side and all the red points are on the other side. So now you can easily take uh, this last layer, which basically is like a linear model that says, okay, everything on one side is blue, everything on the other side is red. So that is the key to success uh, in this application, okay? Um, and um, this ResNet really has been a game changer, not only for us, um, it's been uh, hugely successful. What the property that we will use most in, mostly in my talk is that in a ResNet, UN can be seen as a forward Euler approximation of U at some arbitrary time big T, where I can uh, describe U as, an, as a differential equation. So I have a DTU equal to F. F depends on all the weights of the ODE. Now I make them continuous in time because it's, I think, how we should think about them. Um, and they, the dynamics start that you not. Um, so, so this connection uh, has, has pointed out in, in uh, Wine and A's paper here and in uh, L. Haber in my paper um, two years, two, th three years ago. Um, and is one of the key advantages um, that we will use to gain insight and improve the efficiency of machine learning. Um, and for this choice of F, you actually get back the, the model from the previous slide. So what are ex advantages of ResNet over other architectures that have been known also in the machine learning world? So ResNets oftentimes improve with depth and that's not to be taken for granted. In a normal neural network, you would also hope that with more weights, you actually learn a better function, but that can be quite tricky because if you add a layer, the whole mapping is going to change since a neural network layer typically cannot interpret or cannot express the identity mapping so much. Um, ResNets have achieved state-of-the-art results across the board. It's one of the most versatile architectures I know. And they are, they are known to be relatively easy to train and easy to, um, to augment with more depth. So here on the right-hand side, I, I, find, I want to show you a beautiful picture uh, from, from this uh, paper by Tom Goldstein's group, where they compare the loss function uh, along two randomly chosen but smartly chosen directions for a standard 56 layer network and a ResNet. And you see this, uh, this big gain in smoothness that comes in from the, from the ResNet. I'm not gonna say it's a nice function to minimize because you can see uh, you may not end up at the minimizer if you start in one of the flat regions, but um, the smoothness I think looks uh, quite, could be one of, the, one, one of the explanations why ResNets can be easier to train. Um, in practice, I want to make uh, two comments. Uh, this function f here will be more complicated. So just take this as a, as a gateway into the business. Um, and also you should think about a uh, concatenation of resonates in practice, uh, because the resonate, since it's an ODE or a discrete ODE, it cannot change the width of the network, which can be beneficial in some applications. And on a really interesting note, uh, Yanis Kavrikidis um, has, has been in touch with me uh, very much recently. Um, and he's pointed me to some of his earlier way, uh, works from the last wave of AI research, where they have um, had similar ideas to construct continuous networks, um, also extensions to PDEs, which I'll talk about later, and even used uh, implicit time integrators. So I put uh, two main references here, and uh, I highly recommend uh, to, to, to read those papers. It's, uh, it's, it's quite fascinating, actually. And we didn't know it at the time that we uh, published our paper, but um, but uh, I highly recommend uh, looking into those. Okay, so I wanna give you a quick overview about our first paper in this area um, that pointed out the relation between uh, training of resonance and, con and, and continuous problems in parameter estimation and control. The main question we asked ourselves though was um, under which conditions on the network and the weights is the forward propagation stable? So we think about this as, as our function f, our prediction, be relatively independent by small perturbations of the input uh, vector y. And there are two motivations or three motivations for us really. So the first one was, so we saw getting the weights, so the training as sort of an inverse problem for an ODE. And the first thing an inverse problem you want uh, is a well-posed uh, forward propagation. 
Then also you could relate this to adversarial attacks where small perturbations are added to consistently fool the classifier, which indicates some instability. And also the training performance should be, should be better when you have a stable model. So what we found was maybe not surprising that um, this model I showed you uh, previously will in generally, will generally be not be stable for, for any given K or B. Uh, it's a nonlinear um, um, and uh, time dependent dynamics. So our stability analysis is rather simplified, but we can already rule out uh, stability for many cases. Uh, so you may want to think about constraints on K and B. Uh, rather than doing that, because we didn't want to complicate the training problem, we went for constructing K uh, so for, for many, for a few different architectures. One used an anti-symmetric uh, K. Um, the other one uh, was loosely inspired by Hamiltonian uh, dynamics. To those dynamics, we cannot use the forward Euler uh, method as it's not going to be stable. So we used symplectic integrators and that was actually quite interesting because the architecture, which is the discretization, was not equal to the resonance that we started with. And that is one consistent um, uh, theme throughout our works, that we go from the resonance to the continuous model, then we study this, model this the way we like it to be, and then we go back to something I, ho I hope is better than a resonance. Um, but that is really a consistent theme. Um, and uh, for the task, we looked at very many different choices of architectures gave good results, which was quite uh, fascinating at the time. Uh, so this work has, has inspired quite a few follow-ups. Uh, our main priority in, in, those, uh, in, in, this in these works were more expressive architectures, so going for, for different layers and uh, challenging examples uh, that impress machine learning, the machine learning community. We've also in the meantime uh, gotten better stability results and others have actually uh, also done a lot of uh, nice work in this area. Um, our understanding of the con or control problem has been dramatically in increased and you know, time integrators and other optimal control um, aspects have been investigated in, in, in this framework uh, since, since this paper and Wayne and A's paper came out. Um, so there have been many nice developments happening in this area. Um, the most popular or widely known follow-up from our work is, is what's now known as neural ODEs, described in this paper by Chen et al. Um, so in this paper, there are uh, three distinctions to our work. Um, so the first is um, the, the neural ODE is based on an adaptive time integrator. So it really tackles the continuous training problem, unlike us uh, who are going to discretize um, in the beginning. This means also that for the training, the gradients are computed um, with, the, with the adjoint equation backward in time. Then the third one, um, the third suggestion they make is, uh, is to save memory because so you need the u of t here in the, in the adjoint equation, which we also need uh, to be honest uh, when we apply backpropagation or chain rule. Um, but here the authors suggest to recompute it backward in time by integrating the ODE backward in time. Um, the biggest contribution really is that, and the achievement is that, th that this team has really popularized these uh, continuous math models in the machine learning community, which is actually a big thing uh, to, to penetrate. So there have been uh, best paper award and, and press cover coverage that is now really helpful also for our community as we keep refining uh, some of these ideas. Um, there have been many, um, many uh, follow-ups that have been based on the neural ODE. I want to highlight this, this nice work by Golami et al. Uh, for two reasons. So one, they have a nice example why you should not take uh, step three here and integrate an ODE backward in time, as even if the forward is stable, it may be stable, uh, unstable backwards. Uh, and they propose a better alternative using checkpointing. And also what they've done is they have uh, basically brought uh, the uh, discussion and also some of the results from optimal control into the machine learning language into machine learning literature by comparing uh, what's known as optimized discretized approaches to discretized optimized approaches based on neural ODEs. So I want to uh, go in a bit more in depth here. So um, the training problem is an optimal control or can be seen as an optimal control problem because uh, our model f of y contains this ODE saw. 
And in optimal control, it's been known for a long time, and there have been a lot of discourses about this um, and fruitful discussions, um, that there are two schools, uh, two ways how you can tackle the problem. One is called optimized discretize, and that is um, what neural ODE really is in the end of the day. It's an optimized discretize method for training ResNets. The idea is to keep uh, the weights and, this, and, and U continuous in time, um, then use Euler-Lagrange equations to get an adjoint, and use adaptive time integrators all the, all the way through the optimization. So it's convenient, but, um, but there is another approach, namely the discretize optimize um, method um, that we are using, and also the anode method by Golami is using, where you first discretize uh, the theta and the U, then you get a discrete problem which you differentiate. So that's known as backpropagation machine learning or chain rule, um, just plain simply. And you keep the discretization fixed during the optimization. So you train the weights for that discretization. So now, okay, two comments here. So first, if you do a really nice job in the discretize optimized method, that means you have many time steps and a good time integrator, you will see no difference between these approaches. If you screw up that choice, you will see a big difference because the DO method will not work. But there is a sweet spot typically where you can uh, save some time, especially when think about a neural ODE. I mean, who says that you have to solve this with a very high accuracy? So here is one example out of many where the training performance for an image classification task shows that in the top, the training loss goes down much, much quicker with, with the discretize optimize in blue than with the, with the optimized discretize. Um, and also this translates into gains in training accuracy. So you can speed up the training quite dramatically. Uh, and there are more examples uh, to be found in the literature about this. So my advice at this point would be use the discretize optimize method. The, the gradient in the optimization will be accurate. You can see more analysis in the, in the Golami paper. Uh, the costs of each training step are going to be fixed. Here actually in the red, the costs are going up and down and, most, and oftentimes up as you train. And um, it typically works very well and can give you, just to give you an impression, maybe a 10x speed up in, in some of the problems we have seen. So, so that all goes back to this paper. Um, another way you can leverage the um, optimal control interpretation is by thinking about training a deep network in parallel through the layers. So that is uh, done with, uh, in, in collaboration with uh, Stephanie Günther and a few other collaborators. And the idea is, is quite simple. So you train uh, the ResNet with the latest parallel and time methods that have been developed for science and engineering problems over the last few years. Um, this goes in two steps. So first you replace the forward propagation and the backward propagation, uh, think about a forward Euler, uh, with a nonlinear multigrid iteration. That may seem strange in the beginning, because um, this will add extra computations, but you replace a sequential process like forward Euler with a parallel and multigrid amenable process, uh, namely multigrid. Um, and the hope is to, um, to the, for these extra computations to pay off in a, in a large parallel setting. The second idea is to simultaneously train the weights and solve the dynamics. And the key advantage here would be that in the beginning when the weights are not optimal, we don't, uh, we're not uh, wasting effort in solving the multigrid scheme uh, very well, okay? So that sounds easy. The heavy work really is, is, was done by Stephanie and, and the rest of the team. So um, I really admire what they've done and they deserve all the credits for what I'm gonna show you. Namely that um, for one of the bigger examples we ran, the parallel multigrid uh, scheme is already faster when using 16 or more cores that see, can be seen in the strong scaling over, over here. And then when you combine this with a simultaneously, simultaneous optimization, you can get some modest speed ups of like a 4X um, when you have a computer with 128 cores. So it's not a great parallel efficiency, but um, here's why I think this is interesting. Namely, in some, in some problems in machine learning, you always want to parallelize over the data first. That's data parallelism. But once you run out of options there or your, your memory uh, is, is crashing your system, this op offers one new approach to, par to get par parallelism through the layers, especially when the network becomes deep. So, um, so that is really the, the main use case of this. And uh, since, since that first paper came out, 
Um, there were there were two follow-ups, one by the rest of the team that uh, accelerated this thing further with nested iterations, but then also independently of us, um, uh, two, uh, two, two authors that uh, have been looking into more efficient parallel in time methods. So that is, uh, that is uh, really adding a high performance computing uh, direction to machine learning pioneered by, by Stephanie in this case. Okay. We have established a connection between ODEs and deep learning. Let's now look at PDEs. Now, the biggest change that, that's going to come is the data. Um, the, we will talk about um, tackling learning problems, not with 2D point clouds, but with speech, image, or video data. So high dimensional data sets. And the key or the workhorse in that area is what's called convolutional neural network CNNs. Put very simply, um, take the previous slides and replace every K with a convolution operator, which is a sparse matrix. In this case here, so you see an image of a digit on the left that's filtered by a five by five stencil uh, to produce this output here, um, which is a sparse operation because only local information is going to be used. And also it uses a number of weights because here you have only 25 weights for one of the matrix K that get, gets from image space to image space. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about digit recognition because that's pretty much a done deal, I think. But here's an open, or I think a more interesting problem and pretty much open, I guess, and a segmentation. So think about um, how, what it takes to, um, to push self-driving cars to a level that they are really safe. One ingredient would be uh, a segmentation tool that takes images of a street scene and produces a labeled output where you can label every pixel according to, is it the street? Is it um, the sidewalk? Is it a pedestrian? Um, so that would be a very, very valuable tool. And the hope is to get there with uh, probably more than one GPU and uh, lots of training data, which in this case uh, may be actually uh, not so cheap to get because you have to sit down and, and actually label all the, all the pixels. So not only is that a challenge, here are some key challenges um, that are going to, um, to keep us busy for, for, for the, the next few slides. First, the input dimension is very high. So an image consists of about 2 million numbers that have to go into your neural network. So that's 700,000 pixels times three color channels. Then also the output dimension goes up. Previously, we had one output for, the, for blue or red. Now we have to have 70,000 outputs where each of this decision uh, has to be made between 32 different classes. Third, convolutions act locally. So if you think about this example and you want to classify the whole image, uh, you need to uh, compare information from, from the top of the image to the bottom of the image. You can compute how many layers you need and you can see that it's actually similar to a CFL condition in PDE. More layers are going to be needed uh, as you increase the resolution. And then fourth, online, so on the car, you need to be very efficient and robust with your predictions. So all of these challenges combined mean that there needs to be more computing power, more, more memory in the training, and also I think new ideas uh, uh, that are needed to solve the problem. So one area that I like to go for inspiration and uh, for, for just getting, get, giving us some hope that we can, that we can uh, combat this problem is, is, is given by, it was conveyed in this image. Uh, you may have seen this image actually in the news um, just a few months ago or, or a year or so. Um, and um, if, you, if you have, then you will realize that this image is an, a reconstructed image of a black hole. So I should say, that this image was not just taken with an iPhone at night. Actually, several telescopes were pointed into the sky and a lot of image processing was used to put these pieces together. And I would argue that this image would not have been made without the huge contributions of a field called PDE-based image processing, which was kicked off, off many decades ago with, with quite a long list of seminal works in this application, most importantly, uh, total variation uh, for, for image reconstruction, which was actually used uh, to, to get the image of the black hole. Um, and um, this connection between PDEs and imaging has been really fruitful. And uh, the common thread in all these very different um, approaches here is really 
that you replace discrete images and operators with functions and PDEs. And what that has uh, allowed us to do is to gain a better understanding, improve the robustness, higher efficiency of all the methods and really new ways to process images and to, to think about images. Um, so if you're interested in this, in this topic, then uh, take a look at the SIAM bookstore. SIAM Imaging Science is happening simultaneously and especially Thomas Pock is gonna give a talk that connects these two worlds. Um, so in deep learning, we are not that far yet. Um, the first step though, that, that um, Eldad Haber and I have taken is to design CNNs that in, inherit some properties of DNNs. Um, so what we've done is we looked at parabolic CNNs that inherit uh, properties like a heat equation, so huge stability, and hyperbolic ones where you can use symplectic integrators to save memories. What we found is that very different ideas from these PDEs and different natures give uh, consistent uh, results actually in, in classification tasks. So here, all of the networks uh, can predict that this is a dog in the image. Um, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so since this first work came out, uh, we and others have done a few uh, add-ons. So one is um, that, uh, uh, fully reversible network that Keegan Lensick has done. I want to highlight that. And also work that Iran Tristers group has been, has been uh, pioneering uh, to save the massive number of CNN weights from the millions to the, uh, down to the few hundred thousand without too much loss of accuracy. Um, and also I should say we've done some work on semi-implicit time-stepping method to increase the field of view of the convolution operators. Um, okay, so Let's now use the last um, time that, that, uh, from this talk to make the connection backwards. So from deep learning to PDEs. So consider this PDE problem that we've all solved uh, in our calculus classes, but think about D being very large. So what are you gonna do if, if D is, is large? Here's an idea. You parameterize the PDE solution phi with a neural network F and minimize Minimize this, this loss function here, which you can derive from a weak form. So you can, you can do this, you can quickly code this up. And there are a few uh, reasons why this could, um, would, would be a good idea. So first, DNNs are mesh free and they scale to high dimensions. Uh, I mean, we just saw imaging examples with hundreds of thousands of inputs. Um, and also you don't need training data because you can use the PDE to train. Um, one critical point is to, to mention that you replace a linear PDE with a non-convex optimization problem, which actually will be stochastic because in high dimensions, you're gonna um, discretize with, with an expected value here. Nevertheless, huge advances have been made in, in recent years here, um, generalizing uh, finite element ideas to deep, deep networks, uh, going to stochastic fractional operators, and also uh, devising specific uh, analytical results for, for deep nets approximating PDE solutions. So we have done some work um, together with Stan Osha's group in this area, namely to use DNNs to solve optimal transport and mean field games in high dimensions. So uh, I show you one example here of an OT problem where you have a row zero and a row one and you want to map all the blue points to the red points. And that mapping is going to be discretized by a, by a neural network in our case. So our method takes a variational approach to get the, the learning problem, but also in, incorporates optimality conditions given by hamilton jacobi bellman equations. Um, we use uh, 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 mesh-free and Lagrangian PDE solver for the continuity equation. Um, we use a tailored neural network that gives us fast gradients. And to our big surprise, what we found out is that for D equal two, where you can solve this problem using convex programming, we actually are tied with hugely different uh, numerical schemes. Um, in higher dimensions, we tested synthetic problems up to D100. Uh, we did not see the curse of dimensionality kick in. Costs went up, but more linearly than exponential, I'd say. Um, and it was crucial for us to really work with all the optimality conditions. So the combination of calculus, PDE, and deep learning really paid off for us in the end to improve the efficiency and the accuracy. 
And to give you an idea where this leads, so these similar approaches are being used in machine learning applications. So I think Gabriel Perret will talk about high dimensional optimal transport, but there are also other works here. Um, my collaborators at UCLA have extended this also to stochastic mean field games, which is a big challenge. Uh, in CP1, my student Derek Onken is going to present a poster on applications. And Levon Nebekian is going to speak in MS18 about this problem in length. Okay, so let me summarize my talk. Um, so first I should say that if you got interested now in the, in the relation between deep learning and PDE, there are good news because uh, these next two weeks are going to be full of, of activities. So I've uh, compiled this long list. You can find it in my slides uh, that you can access uh, through the link I posted in the chat window. And I highlighted maybe the, the not so obvious ones. So first I think uh, I'm really curious to check out the poster and the contributed sessions because I'm curious how posters are going to be held remotely and how, uh, um, how much interactive that would be. So, so definitely this is on my list. Um, and then also there are three actually interesting tutorials in, in parts of these areas about uh, the numerical linear algebra, fractional operators, and also parallel in time that are related to what I've talked about. And uh, my former colleague, Michael Muller, and Daniel Kramer, they actually have a mini tutorial in the sign imaging science where they uh, dwell much more about this, this uh, combinations uh, about model-based and uh, learning-based approaches that I started my talk with. So I think that's, that's going to be quite interesting. Um, then if you run out or you need immediate entertainment, uh, I've also added a few uh, lectures from the recent SIM math data science meeting, uh, some IPAM talks and some other talks that we, but also others have given uh, on, on topics related to what I covered today. And to conclude, I mean, I want to kind of go back to my initial statement and I hope I convinced everyone that mathematics is going to play actually quite a big role in, in deep learning in the future and deep learning can actually also play a, a good role in, in PDE problems, especially in high dimensions. Um, uh, what we covered was um, the connection from PDE to deep learning to create insight, efficiency, robustness, but also the way back to tackle the curse of dimensionality. I had to keep that one short, but Levon is going to talk about that also in the mini symposium. It's important to say what we did not cover. Uh, so if you are uh, excited now, branch out into unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning, reinforcement learning, active learning. There's a whole world out there um, yet to explore. And uh, most importantly on my agenda is actually this connection. So I want to really bring deep learning and PDEs together to overcome some of the challenges with generalization, but also with model-based solutions on the other hand. So I think in a bit, we'll have a short Q&A but also after this, uh, I'm going to open up my own Zoom room in case we get kicked out. So if you cannot ask your question then, join me at about 6 p.m. I'm gonna drop the, the link in the chat window also. And I really wanna thank Siam, Keynes, my collaborators that were directly involved in the projects, and also my many mentors, colleagues, and collaborators that work with me on other things, um, and all the funding agencies um, for that. And with that, I'm gonna conclude take all your questions uh, you may have. And thank you once again for, for sticking around here. Okay, thank you very much Lars for this uh, excellent talk. So um, if you have a question, you can post a question in the Q&A and I think we'll start with, um, yes, yeah, so there's no chat window, but the questions can go to Q&A. Oh, okay, so. Oh, you didn't get my links that I posted. No, the chat window is not there. Um, okay, nothing we can do about it. So let right me now. go yes. to this important slide here, which has the link to the, to the Zoom uh, that I'm going to open up. So I'll give you five minutes or so to copy that. Um, and I can also go back to the title where I have the link to my slides. Yes, and Lars, will you post the slides on your webpage also? They are actually on my webpage. They are on the webpage? Not linked yet, so, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. If you put them there, okay. Yeah. So maybe, um, okay, some people do see the link, it seems. Okay. Um, okay. So. So these are the hard questions. Are there, are there easier ones also? Yes, yeah, so how about questions about the talk? And I actually have a question <laughs> maybe to get started. So you mentioned the neural ODEs and, and yeah. that looks really like a very interesting framework, both the, discretize and optimize or the other way around. Um, 
But one of the main things of that neural ODEs paper was that they can do high order discretizations for the ODEs. But when would it actually be beneficial to use high order over low order? Because in the examples in that paper, it doesn't seem to be clear at all when it would actually be beneficial. Yeah, that's a great question, Hans. So actually, uh, Bin Dong and, and his collaborators have used uh, multi-step methods and uh, high order integrators um, right at the time where we came out with the first works. Uh, um, and they've seen uh, some improvements um, in their papers. Um, so it may be giving you some efficiency in some tasks. Uh, we yet have to find out exactly which tasks are, benef are benefiting from this. Um, so in our, work, in our group, we have done some comparisons. And um, most of the time, I mean, it never hurts to have a better time integrator. But also, depending on the problem you work on, you may, you may sometimes be disappointed. At least that's what, what we got typically. And I guess one reason is that for imaging problems, which we mostly work on, you really need some implicit uh, flavor to, to the problem because this will allow you to couple across the whole image space. And I mean, computer science and engineering people for parabolic equations always use uh, semi-implicit or fully implicit schemes. Um, for exactly that reason, to get mesh independence conversions, which means overcoming the field of view problem in machine learning. So, so that is, I think, uh, for me, the, the bigger issue is to get uh, the stability out of co uh, under control, but also then to, um, to have uh, very few and, and cheap time steps um, that couple the whole image space. Yes, okay, so that's like the global connection of the image. Uh, uh, okay, so there are some questions here, like one question is about commenting on how ODEs and PDEs can help to design ResNets, like change the architecture and, and lead to a better architecture. That's a question from Tao Li. Yes, so, so that is a, a great question because it's really at the core of what we are doing. Um, so think about the following uh, analogy that I, that I gave already. So you take this very simple network model and, and let me actually go to that slide real quick. Um, so think about taking this ODE here and making it stable by replacing K with a matrix A minus A transpose. So that if you freeze the coefficients would, should give you stability. But um, most importantly, I mean, you now cannot use a forward Euler method anymore. So here now, if you use, say, an Adam Bashforth method, which we, which we have used for this specific case, um, you actually are stable on the discrete level. But an Adam Bashforth scheme does not look like a forward Euler, and thus also doesn't look like a ResNet. So that is kind of this, this uh, thing that the final architecture will actually look different to the one you started out with. Okay. And then in the Hamiltonian systems, uh, we actually split the variables in two parts. And those um, this discrete schemes that will then be the network architecture look very distinct from ResNets. OK, thank you. Then another question is from Zoran Shen. Um, how much time does it take to train the neural network for the 100 dimensional PDE, that, uh, like the, the high dimensional problem? Yeah, so that's um, referring to this problem that I showed you only in one dimension because plotting in 100D, I, I still haven't figured out. Um, so I don't want to really um, over, oversell the time advancements here uh, that we have made. Uh, my student Derek Onken in his preprint actually has done more than 100D um, in machine learning uh, applications. Um, so think about, in, in my understanding, with my own code that I wrote uh, with, with, with Stan's project, um, think about an hour or so. Um, so it's, um, it depends how well you want to train it. We still are having troubles with using the right stochastic gradient method there. But think about hours, definitely not days, and on a normal computer with no GPU. Um, and again, uh, go to Derek's poster and ask him um, about his new code, which is shiny and PyTorch and even faster. Okay, thank you. Then there is a question about uh, from Shen Yu. Yu. Uh, can PDs help to interpret what's going on in uh, deep neural network? Um, yeah, so so th there it really depends what you need what what you mean by interpret. Uh, so how high is the bar? If the bar is as high that you want to get the information 
about why the deep neural network classifies this image as a dog, definitely not at this point. There are more things that we need to pull off there. If, um, on the other hand, you kind of look for some weaker things, um, like robustness to noise, um, I mean, just a model that behaves in a more predictable way, then I think with, with more effort, PDEs can be made somewhat interpretable. And, uh, and at least with the Hamiltonian structures that we have, they are also invertible in a stable way. So you can actually go back to the original data space um, and propagate some of the informations. But this is uh, very far away from the interpretability of Navier-Stokes equations and, and solvers for that. Uh, so uh, that I don't want to oversell. Okay, so maybe we have time for one or two more questions. So uh, one question is, uh, do we use deep learning to adjust the PDE model parameters or to solve the PDEs yeah. and how to create data sets? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's also an excellent question. And um, in, so in our work on the mean field games, we're using the deep neural network to solve the variational problem and the associated optimality conditions. Uh, there is no as parameter estimation part of this. But I should say that in, uh, in uh, these first, this paper by Raisi et al, they actually combine uh, parameter estimation and PDE solution with, with these, uh, what, what, what uh, are called physics informed neural networks. Um, and uh, you, you, you may find these papers actually useful to, to see how they generate training data. Um, as far as I know, they, they actually work on the weak formulation, on the strong formulation, so they don't explicitly need training data, um, just maybe some measurements for the parameter estimation part. But, the, but uh, this paper and, and, the, and the works that followed, I think, would be, would be, um, would be the most appropriate uh, place to look for. Yeah, maybe just a small comment there. I think they use the fact that uh, the neural network function is differentiable. Yeah. You just take x, y point and you compute the partial derivatives and derive the residual to zero, basically. That is the loss yeah. function. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so you can see this in this example here where, I mean, all I need to know is, about, is, is how to compute a gradient of the neural network, which is f, with respect to x. And mm -hmm. backpropagation can do this for you. Uh, automatic differentiation can do this for you. If you want to use neural ODs, adjoint methods can do this for you. Um, but that is, I think, the, the charming point here that you don't need a, a mesh of neighboring points and finite differences or finite elements, but um, you, you use these approximators. Okay, maybe the uh, last question then. Um, Yeah, so that is again a question about, uh, from Zi Chao Peng, uh, a question about boundary conditions um, when you solve for PDEs. So you have um, additional terms in the loss function, but are there other ways to deal with boundary conditions? Um, yeah, so, so in, in, in our work so far, we were lucky that we didn't have to have boundary, uh, boundary conditions. Um, I know this is a kind of, uh, at least the way I presented it, which was oversimplified, because I mean, no one is uh, probably interested in solving Poisson's problem in this way. Um, that is, is, of course, a big issue. I mean, you have a constraint, you have either a penalty or, or whatnot in a stochastic uh, problem. This can be hard to do. Um, I I, I think uh, Nathan Trusk from Sandia, um, I don't have a reference for this in my slide, I'm sorry, but he has told me about some work that they have been doing to incorporate um, some of some physics uh, into the deep neural network. I think that's what I would start with to think, can you design a network that already has uh, the conditions being, being satisfied? And I know in some, some older works from the last wave uh, of AI research in the 90s, uh, there were actually some works that are that um, blended um, solutions inside the domain with with fixed boundary conditions on the outside, but I would even have to look that up also. So that is a that is a hard problem. So, but you can start with looking at these papers that I do that I did list because they talk about that at, at length. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this might be a good time to finish the Q and A here. And so, as Lars was saying, he is going to open up his, uh, yeah. his uh, Zoom room to, for further discussion for anybody uh, who is interested. So thanks a lot everybody for attending and for sticking around. We hope 
you enjoy the rest of the conference later this week and next week. And I would like to thank uh, Lars again for this uh, really excellent talk on a very interesting topic. Thank you very much and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Hans, for, for sharing and uh, hope to see you in the other room in a few minutes. Just give me a minute or so to open that up. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye.